Good afternoon. <clears throat> Today on Wednesday of Holy Week, uh, the gospel story uh, takes us to Judas. And people who don't know anything about the gospels or scripture often know about Judas, uh, one of the most famous characters in the Bible, uh, betrayal. And, and he has become almost a symbol of betrayal, the kiss of betrayal. Uh, the kiss of a friend, um, the betrayal of a friend. And so we have this dramatic story that has been sort of going, uh, building up in the Gospels of Jesus moving toward the cross, moving toward Jerusalem. Now that he's in Jerusalem, there's a tension. Um, the leaders, it says that the chief priests and the rulers uh, are plotting to kill Jesus. And so there is this uh, heightened tension in the story. And now, uh, as we read the gospel today, Judas meets with these leaders and offers to betray Jesus for, for 30 pieces of silver. And so we have this uh, dramatic uh, buildup. And, and it's moving toward uh, a dramatic conclusion as the week moves on tomorrow and then through Good Friday. And so then... In the final part of the gospel reading today, Jesus, uh, it, it's like the camera cuts to Passover. Jesus is at the meal with the disciples, and he acknowledges that he knows one of them is about to betray him. And he lets Judas know that he knows that it's him. And of course, if we followed the story later in the gospel, um, after Judas betrays Jesus, after he gives him the kiss of betrayal, um, he regrets his actions. He takes the money and throws it down in the temple and ultimately ends up committing suicide. And so it's a tragic story. It's a tragic character. And, um, and yet, um, and I, I want to be cautious about how I say what I'm getting ready to say. I, I'm not trying to make any theological statements about the person of Judas. Um, because we are just given the bare, bare elements, bare facts there. Uh, this man chooses to betray Jesus, and he ends up taking his own life. But we also know, if we stay in the meal, Jesus also tells Peter he will deny him. And he will deny him adamantly. Uh, you know, three times he will be uh, deny Christ. And then we have the sense that all the disciples, maybe with the exception of John, uh, flee. They flee Jesus, so they abandon him. And yet story we, we most remember of those events is Judas, the betrayal of Judas. And Judas uh, becomes then the scapegoat of the story. And, and there is a, um, there was a, a thinker, uh, Rene Girard, a philosopher, that suggested that if you go back through time, every culture uses scapegoats. That it looks uh, a lot of times human sacrifice is a form of scapegoating. That all the problems in that culture will be put on a person. Uh, and, and it's obvious, if you even look today, uh, it's easy for us to scapegoat, uh, to take all our problems and put on a specific par political party or a specific political person. Uh, sometimes people scapegoat with an entire race. An entire race might be a blame for something. A religion could be scapegoated. Some other group is, uh, becomes uh, the cause of all our woes. And so in that sense, there is this element that we could uh, think of in terms of Judas, of scapegoating, of someone maybe within our own, uh, even within our own lives, even within our own family, that could become the object of the scapegoat. Someone that we blame for a bad day, you know, the way I was treated at a store, uh, something as simple as that. Someone has betrayed me. I'm focused so much on what someone has done to me that I might miss even what's going on in the gospel stories that... Uh, as we read the story, as I read the story, I myself uh, am being indicted. That I myself have the capacity to deny. I myself have the capacity to abandon. I myself have the capacity to betray. Uh, makes me think of Shisako Endo's novel, Silence, where the main character... Uh, Rodriguez is uh, going to Japan 
uh, to uh, find his uh, leader who has betrayed the faith. And Rodriguez believes he is a Christ figure. And along the way, he realizes that he is a Judas figure. And that might be part of the harsh reality of reading these stories is to find ourselves under the indictment of the story uh, held alongside the chief priests and the rulers and the betrayers and the deniers that I myself am in that group that I myself may have done things to other people even as I'm recounting the ways I've been betrayed I've been hurt I myself might actually have betrayed or hurt other people in ways that I don't even uh, acknowledge and may not fully even remember or be aware of so this story should bring a degree of humility, uh, a degree of soul-searching. I think of another story of a theologian uh, who has since died, but his name was Ray Anderson. He taught at Fuller Seminary. He said he was at a restaurant one day, and he uh, went in to use the restroom. And on the uh, bathroom uh, mirror, he saw the words, Come home, Judas. All is forgiven. He didn't know the story behind those words. He didn't know who they were talking to. But it hit him hard. Come home, Judas. All is forgiven. It has that sense of the prodigal son story. Who is truly only repentant because of the Father's mercy and grace. The only way I am not a betrayer, the only way I have not gone and killed myself out of my, my, because of my evil deeds is because I've been shown mercy and grace. And so may, one, if I feel like I am a betrayer, or I am aware of this, that I might know that I hear the words come home, all is forgiven. But simultaneously, I might find a way to extend the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ to those who are outside, those who I have condemned, those who I have uh, considered my enemy even, that I might pray for them and extend the mercy and grace of Christ in hopes that they might know the fullness of love. Bless you as we proceed forth in this holy week and as we enter upon these final days of meditation upon the glory of God in Christ.